digest the, uh, um, uh, the question of the pool, uh, yes. the notion of the pool as otherwise um, explained it is, and who's in it, and who's not in it. Uh, my short point is uh, section 23 applies to this exercise, and those with an interest in taking maternity leave, to the extent that they are, are not in it. Um, those who wish to take shared parental leave, or indeed the unpaid parental leave that I mentioned before that's been available since 2006, are in it. So there will be some women who wish to take uh, shared parental leave, for example, in place of their better maternity leave and maternity, rates, uh, mater maternity pay rights, and they're in uh, these rules to that extent. So we, we end up in a position where the way that the PCP has been only includes those who have an interest, in effect, in taking shared parental leave at the statutory rates. That's the, as a result of the PCP that's been chosen. Uh, and that's why we see, it could be said to be a slight oversimplification that's being dealt with in the way we see in the Control Tribunal judgment at, uh, at page um, 118. Page 118. Oh, that's right. Which paragraph? Uh, we're looking at paragraph 62. 62. Bearing in mind the tribunal has uh, reminded itself of section 23, the comparator provision. And, they, and again, they, they put it very simply and shortly that they, when they refer to section 23, refer back to their earlier reasoning uh, in relation to direct discrimination. Well, I just want to talk about the, P, the, the PCP. Um, you, you say it's going to claim it to select the PCP. Yes. And is this right? You don't say there's anything inherently in the way the PCP has been described here to make it not a PCP. No, no, that was the... It, it was accepted below and we, we accept now that... So you, you, may, you, you, have no, you have no complaint about the, about the PCP as such. No, there are only two ways you complain about it. Either one, that it's really a James and Eastley Borough Council quasi-PCP that it isn't one, uh, or that we don't actually apply that, so in fact it doesn't occur. Now, we, we do accept that it is, a, it is a PCP that we apply. Yeah. And we, we don't say um, that it is inherently, it, that it inherently suffers from a James and Eastley Borough Council problem, <coughs> namely being a cipher of direct That said, we accept the PCP as we must, because that's the way the claimant wants to rely on it. <coughs> but just so that I know, for when I make my submissions, does that mean that ground two of the appeal is now withdrawn? Ground two, ground, two of the ground, ground two of the Forty's appeal is that this was, in truth, a direct discrimination, di discrimination claim on the basis of an application of James and Eastley. We, we say they've chosen a PCP which is which produces no particular disadvantage and in fact what they're really saying is that we only pay enhanced maternity pay to the maternity leavers and that is the James and Eastley point we'll come to that we'll come, we'll come, we'll come to that I'm just trying to take it stage by stage at the moment so yes. <coughs> if we leave aside justification this part of your case really turns on <coughs> who properly is to be described as falling within the pool. Yes. It's really what this part of your case this turns This part, yes. yes. So where, where do you get that section 23 applies to the exercise of finding who is in the pool? Do you say, do you say that the pool is 
19.2a, uh, we apply or would apply it to, to men and to women, but it puts men to a particular disadvantage compared with women. <coughs> Logically, it flows from that, that you must um, uh, construct a pool to whom the PCP apl is applied or would apply. But it's not, it's, it's not set out in the legislation that you must select a pool, but it's, it flows from Section 192A, that when you're conducting this exercise... I think, and I, I think what it comes to, uh, from your perspective, is this. When you're defining the pool by reference to the PCP, the pool is characterised by those who would want to have shared parental leave, and that is at the statutory limit. Yes. And so that's it, that's the pool. The pool of those people who want to share in the who want to share parental leave and they all want to share parental leave and it's across the board, the whole the whole pool, that's at the statutory rate. That's a concomitant of wanting to be in the shared that shared parental that, that's the way you put it. That's the short point. Yes. Um, from that we move to the Rutherford case, Secretary of State in Rutherford, which illustrates the problem for claimants that might arise they select a pool that they perhaps um, uh, well, they, they have some remorse about and take the court to that. That's, uh, no, just sorry, before we go to Rutherford, Mr. Patrick, can you just remind us of how the pool was, how and by whom and when was the pool originally defined? Um, well, uh, the pool took different forms, as I understand it, below. Finally settled upon by the tribunal in a way that they have rather briefly expressed it um, in their judgment. Um, which which exactly. paragraph? That's, that's in. They, they wrap it all up, but they, they do with the paragraph 63. For the first time, it was redefined for the EAT by Judge Richardson. Uh, and we say that there's no material difference between Judge Richardson's formulation, for the reasons I was trying to outline before, and the very brief formulation one deduces from the tribunal judgment. But Judge Richardson's formulation is what all those police officers with present or, in, or future interest in taking leave in order to... That's not in paragraph 63. Well, that's on, 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 on appeal at the Rule 310 hearing. Sorry, which, which page are we looking at now for your... For Judge Richardson? So, we, we just refer me to the paragraph which contains the definition. Set out by um, Mr. Justice Slade at paragraph 61 of section 92. 61 92. Yes, yeah, that's one moment. So paragraph 61. Yes, I It's see. those police officers with present or future interest in taking leave to care for their newborn child. Um, speaking for myself, I don't know what that means. Does it? Does? Is it cases where? Everybody, who, suppose you have a, um, a, a 
young police officer who, as yet, is not a, an expectant mother or father, but says, when I do start a family, I would like to take part in caring for uh, a child when he or she is born. I, I, I don't understand that, that, that sense of paradoxy. What, was it ever particularly right? Uh, no, it was, it was suggested, as I understand it, by Judge Richardson. Uh, it's taken up by my learned practice. Well, have you challenged? Are, are you appealing in relation to that? Well, we, we, well, well, we, we say, well, we, yes, we are, but we say that's not materially different uh, from the way that the tribunal formulated it. But insofar as it is different, where we held to be different, we do challenge it. So, in other words, we say logically that formulation, attractive though it superficially may be, uh, cannot comprise or include those who either are or would wish to or might wish to take maternity leave and draw down maternity pay. You keep on saying who might wish to take maternity leave, but as I was trying to point out before, my understanding is they have to take maternity leave two weeks. Two weeks, yeah. So it's not who, who might want to, it's anybody who might want to give birth. Well, they will receive, they, they have to receive two weeks maternity yeah. leave and pay, and they can't in fact choose to work for those two weeks. Just, just briefly, because it will interrupt. Yes, of course. Uh, briefly, the enforcement mechanism, which is in Regulation 8 of the Maternity and Parental Leave Regulations 1999, yeah. operates by means of imposing a prohibition <coughs> on the employer against allowing the mother to come to work for two weeks. Right. That, combined with Regulation 7 of the Shared Parental Leave Regulations, which says that shared parental leave can be taken at any point after the birth of the child, means that after the birth of the child, any mother is free to choose to take shared parental leave immediately. And the two-week period, compulsory period imposed by the Pregnant Workers Directive can be given effect to by taking shared parental leave. And the employer will not commit any offence, provided that the mother doesn't attend work during those two weeks uh, that she's absent for. Uh, so on that basis, there, there isn't actually any requirement for statutory maternity leave. So she can't come to work. She can't go to work. There's no offence committed by the employer as long as she doesn't go to work. But which type of leave she takes is a matter of choice for the mother. As long as she takes a minimum period of two weeks. So even those two weeks can be paid at the statutory rate. Well, I, I'm still struggling with the question which I thought we were addressing before we started moving to Rutherford, which is, what is it that says that you should remove from the pool women who are materially different, which you say includes women who are taking or would take maternity leave and get maternity pay. Where does it say in, I mean, section 23 says it applies for the purpose of making the comparison, there must be no material difference between the circumstances relating to each case. So can you, can you move me from there to how that affects, how, how that brings about what you say it brings about, which is the exclusion from women taking maternity leave from the pool? Because those, their circumstances are those which um, mean they cannot be in the pool. When you conduct the comparative exercise, or the, well, the, cons the consideration of whether men are at a particular disadvantage in comparison with women when you apply the PCP to the pool, you can't do that, whereby you have a comparison that involves women who are in th this category, because of Section 23, because of their circumstances being materially different. <coughs> I think this is a critical part of your case right now. That's why we're starting well, to... Well, so the equal pay, well, of course. I'll win on that. This, all right, well, let's just do that. 
I, I now understand, I hadn't understood before, that it was part of your appeal, one of your grounds of appeal, to challenge paragraph 61 of um, the EAT's judgment. You told me it is, and it's part of your grounds of appeal. Yes. Um, That's ground three, I think. It's ground three, is it? Right. I will have got in due course. Um, now, where where is the, refer me to the exact paragraph where you say the ET got it right. Where did the ET, in, in the bundle, which paragraph? They got it right in the exercise they carried out, paragraph 62. So they don't, so the ET doesn't describe the, the, who's in the no. pool. No. So there's no description in the ET of who's in the pool. No, but it's quite clear in my submission that they are applying it to a pool of people who do not include maternity leavers and merely include those uh, who are taking shared parental leave and receiving uh, the statutory rate of pay. Right. So what normally happens? What normally happens is, as you say, PCP is selected by the claimant, yes. the pool is unidentified, mm. and then you see whether there is a particular disadvantage. Mm. As I understand what you're saying is in the ET, uh, the, um, the, there was an identification of the PCP and they went straight to describing what the disadvantage was. And you're inferring from that what they think the pool was. Well, is, that, is that right? Well, I, I say it's an irresistible inference. Well, well I think the that, that's they, the way they miss they, out that middle stage. They, they, don't, they don't say, and the pool was. The pool is. Right. In, the, it, in the ET, not the EAT. In the ET, <laughs> paragraph 62. So you mean because what be, because the way they describe it is because the, because the way they they say there's no disadvantage is because whoever applies is going to be paid at the same rate. You say that that by in, irresistible inference must be and it can only mean that everybody in the pool is some a, 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 that the pool comprises exclusively people who would not be entitled to maternity. That's right, so it includes the people on unpaid parental leave that's been available for some years under the determination, as well as the newer species of individuals in Paragraph 62 who statutory pay for shared parental leave. So the pool formulated by the ET excluded people on maternity leave or who might be able to take maternity leave, and only included people who are interested in taking shared parental leave or the earlier parental leave, the maternity leave. Well, that's what you say, yes. And there might be certainly on the other side, I have no idea what's going to be said, there might be something on the other side, there's a fatal mistake there, because they did miss out the, vi the vital thing of saying who's in the pool might be saying, therefore, they didn't carry out the exercise properly. So that's the other way of looking at it. I'm sure it will be so. Oh, I see. Well, okay, good, right. <laughs> but, uh, All right, so do you want to go on to your fuller point now, then? Yes, well... Your longer point. Well, the, it's not that long you'd be grateful to uh, be here, I hope. But uh, uh, we, we say that um, this is an example of a, of a situation very similar to the Rutherford where the application of the PCP pool to, to uh, the relevant pool of people necessarily means you end up with the sort of finding you see at paragraph 62 of the Informal Tribunal Judgment. So if I can take the court to... Well, uh, yeah. Thank you. Pad 12 of the uh, authority plan. Trying to find out which is the authority plan. Oh, so which tab is it? It's tab uh, 12. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Facts and taken relatively easily. Um, in short, that at the time there was a provision um, that removed the right not to be unpaid for 
dismissed and moved reaching the age of 65. Yes. And this is before there was any bar on age discrimination. This was said to be indirect sex discrimination. And uh, it comes to the time, I don't know if you can analyze the judgments in great detail, but at least two of the uh, speeches of the um, Judicial Committee um, included detailed statistical analysis showing that there was no um, uh, disadvantage or disparate effect on one group compared to the other, males or females. But um, the other species of, of speech looked simply at who was in the relevant pool. And it's nicely described, uh, page 600 of the report, um, paragraph 76 and 77 by uh, Baroness Hale of Richmond in, in her speech from the end of the judgment, um, at the end of the uh, report. Um, now, and we pick it up um, just above letter D in the margin, so three lines down in the paragraph. The people who want the protection are so the people... Letter D, where? where? Um, page 600. Page 600, my lord. Yes, uh, got that. 76. Yes. Uh, the people who want the protection yes. Yes. Uh, are the people who are still in the workforce at the age of 65, and the rule has no disproportionate effect upon any particular group within that group. It applies to the same proportion of women of that group as it applies to men. There is no comparison group who wants this particular benefit and can more easily obtain it. The appellants cannot object that this approach defines the advantage and disadvantage by reference to the very rule that is under attack. On the contrary, that is exactly what they have sought to do by treating advantage and disadvantage as being under or over the age of 65. So by analogy, we say that the PCP achieves a similar effect in the present case, namely that it, it uh, bites on those in particular who have an interest in uh, taking shared parental leave, which is only ever paid if a statutory rate. So both groups are equally advantaged or disadvantaged. Well, can I, can I just put this in standing back? I'm just testing your case. I'm not expressing a view about what the outcome should be. Um, if you've got, in a, in a, in a because you're looking at the statute a lot, can we just move away slightly from that and envisage a contract of employment? Yes. In the contract of employment, um, um, uh, on the what, there are provisions which provide for maternity leave uh, at a particular rate, for a particular period of time. It also provides for shared parental leave in the same way facilitated by the statute. So uh, the um, birth mother can give up the right to maternity leave and can then have um, shared parental leave. Um, now, you accept, and it's generally accepted, that at least one of the um, justifications, appropriate justifications, for maternity leave is to look after the child. It's one of a whole number of reasons, of reasons but it's one. Uh, and am I correct in thinking, please tell me if I'm wrong about this, according to the intervener's submissions and the evidence of, is James, is it? Jackson. Jackson's Jackson, yes, I think it's Jackson. That, that the intervener would accept that after 26 weeks, effectively, uh, the birth mother then is using maternity leave to look after the child in the normal case. Yeah. That's as I understand the submission and the evidence. Yeah. What is, and I, I'm putting to this to you just so you can answer it, what, what, is, what is wrong then with looking at the pool as including, so far as concerned looking after the child, the mother, whether they want, or the potential mother, for whom one of the objectives of maternity leave is looking after the child. True it is that there are a lot of other reasons, but in that we they share that characteristic with everybody else in the pool. Now, why, why, did, why would it be wrong, bearing in mind the way the PCP is formulated, to say that they therefore too should be included in the pool, insofar as they want and have the facility to look after the child? 
Um, it's sort of saying step back from doing that. Well, if one accepted the intervener's point in relation to the purpose changing beyond the 26 week, uh, we, I mean, I'm not sure if I can't now recall if I outlined what the payment rights are to people, which I can do in a second very shortly. But, but I've now, now stepped up. But I'm just dealing with it generally, and but, not, not this particular. But beyond the 26 weeks, remember that the officer will have started her maternity leave um, at the very latest on the day she gave birth, by definition. <coughs> that that's when it must start by. And you can start it earlier. I wasn't relating so, to this particular case. I was trying to have a, a general kind of situation. Right, well, in a case similar to this, where there's 18 weeks of pay that's, that's, uh, to which the uh, person's entitled, that runs out by the time you've reached 26 weeks. But what and happens so in a case where it's more than 26 weeks? What happens in a case, therefore, where there's maternity leave of more than 26 weeks? I'm just trying to understand how it's applied generally, not just this case. Because mm -hmm. anything we say in this case may be applicable in other situations. So I'm just trying to get a, a and indeed the general principles shouldn't the general principles shouldn't surely be that much adjusted by the facts of the case. That that should be should be of general a general nature. Well, we would say in relation to that we, we obviously we don't accept um, the, the point that the purpose of maternity leave changes by that point. No. Insofar as it were applied to our case, we still would win. Because yeah. the payment terms run out, so if you put the post twenty six weekers into the pool, they're still being paid the statutory rate. Yeah. That deals with the six week. But what about but the more, more general broadly, point? Yes, but more broadly, they're still not comparable uh, because they are still taking maternity leave for a combination of purposes. We say, uh, and their payment rights reflect both the pregnant workers directive and the more general principle that maternity leave and maternity pay, which are inextricably linked, exist in order to prevent disadvantage and redress disadvantage and imbalance. But it is quite possible, and it goes way beyond our case, but it's, it may be that the Honourable Mr Burns will want to address the point, although it doesn't really, his case is a, a direct discrimination case, where the employer chose, for example, to give a more generous maternity leave um, payment provision that correct into the post-26 week period, we would say that still um, that will be justifiable uh, and therefore there will not be re re relevant comparators to be put into the pool, except if the rights are excessive. In other words, if, if the right goes on for years and years or is very, very, very generous, more generous than the normal payment rights of um, the employees in question, then it may be said that this is disproportionate and goes beyond the need to protect women um, who take maternity leaves for the reasons that I went into. So maybe there's a, there'll be a, a bigger evaluative exercise that's required in those sort of cases to decide whether, in effect, these women have been overcompensated um, or, uh, uh, in terms of maternity leave, and therefore they are relevant comparators to be put into the pool. So in a different case, one can see that an over-generosity in either the duration or the payment terms uh, of maternity uh, leave provisions might result in a need to carry out that evaluative exercise, perhaps in terms of a, uh, an equal terms claim, or if it was put as an equal pay claim validly, then in terms of looking at um, whether you could include these individuals as, as comparators in the pool for comparison under Section 23, or using Section 23. But we, we say we're not in that territory. This is clay, plainly a situation within the short term. It comes down all, all the time to the same point, though, in the pool. I mean, it comes down back and back again, mm -hmm. again, to your point that maternity leave, the people who want maternity leave are simply in a different, who are entitled to maternity leave, and who may want to take it, yes. are simply in a, uh, they are not uh, to the required extent comparable. Because maternity leave, while it includes um, a consideration for looking after the child, includes what we call the five factors, yeah. which are peculiar to the birth mother and not to anybody else. That's what it all comes down to. Well, more fundamentally, it comes down to the fact that pregnancy and maternity are only conditions that can affect women. And therefore, it cannot be a valid comparison. They cannot be valid for the comparative exercise um, for the purposes of Section 23 for that reason. <coughs> but in relation to your law,
Courtship's um, wider point drawn from the intervener's argument, there may need to be the sort of exercise that was carried out in De Bellin, um, tab uh, 17 of the authorities, uh, in terms of a much more generous maternity leave um, and maternity pay um, entitlement in a contract of employment, for example. I mean, am, I, am I wrong? Because the intervener has made no, got no right to make all the representations. So just I, I didn't hear all the terms. The, the intervener has no right to make all the representations. That's correct. But am I right or wrong in thinking? I may well be wrong. But I, my impression was that the intervener, for all the pragmatic reasons that they've set out, um, both in the skeleton army and in the witness statement, the intervener's position is they think there isn't, there, there is not direct discrimination here. But they say that bearing in mind that justification is not a point that could, in this particular case, the point that has not been challenged on appeal, that they're not against the idea of indirect discrimination. Am I wrong about that? Uh, I, I, may I just take, uh, 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 ask my... My understanding is that, that broadly their, their position. Um, and that's because they think, in terms of policy, it's an attempt. In terms of policy, it's right to encourage men to get more paternity leave. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for the advantage of both the mother and the father, yes. that's what they want to yes. do. Um, but, but presumably you said, well, well, whether that, and I don't think there's any evidence against that, against that sort of policy. Yeah. Um, Submission. I don't think there's any, and nobody, nobody said that's wrong. Yeah. But presumably you would say, well, whether that's a good or a bad policy is a matter for Parliament, not for us. That's right. Um, the distinction, as I said earlier, was between parental leave and maternity leave. If what's called maternity leave in a contract and maternity pay actually turns into something that's more like parental leave, then there would need to be an evaluative exercise in comparison between the two. So that, that appears to be the point they're making, that there comes a point where uh, the uh, maternity leavers are, or may be, uh, relevant comparators for the purpose of Section 23, um, when you go beyond a certain point and the purpose of their leave changes to being mere parental leave as opposed to maternity leave. So uh, I think I, I, well, I've dealt with Rutherford. Uh, as not my broadly last point is this: that in truth, um, the complaint of PC Hexton is that the, there is a PCP which involves paying only birth mothers generous um, pay uh, provisions and giving them generous length of leave. Um, pin that on to the fact that, in fact, the police officer is able to take maternity leave that starts 24 weeks before the birth. She gets 18 weeks full pay, and unlike the, um, the employee on the minimum terms, she then gets the additional six weeks at 90% pay, and then the remaining, I think, 33 weeks uh, at the statutory rate. So she will be advantaged, they would say, in comparison with those who are not able to give birth. But that is a gender-specific criterion, and it's not an appropriate PCP, which is why it hasn't been chosen. But in truth, that, that's what we say this case is about. Uh, and that is, in truth, a direct discrimination claim. And it's, in fact, it's a, it's a discrimination claim based on terms, and we go right back to the start, uh, and that is barred by uh, Section 70, uh, and subsection 2, for the reasons I expressed. So we say even if we're in the territory of indirect discrimination, my last point is this, that um, short though it was, the tribunal's decision is plainly and arguably right. It's the only decision they could come to based on the PCP. Um, even though it would have been better if they had taken the trouble to explain the pool in greater detail. 
we're left to infer it, it would have been better to see it. But the pool is a pool similar to that of Rutherford, which is a pool of people receiving or whose interest entitles them only to receive the statutory rate. So for those reasons, we say the appeal should be allowed and the claim should be dismissed. Unless I'm sitting here forever, those are my solution. Okay. Extremely quick. Started uh, in light of some of the submissions Mr. Bassou made this morning, um, I provided the clerk with, with items I mentioned. Um, Schedule 22 of the Equality Act. Equality Act. I've also provided a <coughs> report of uh, Ministry of Defence and De Beek. So something that Mr. Basu said in submissions, which doesn't feature in the skeleton argument or ground of appeal, was to the effect that um, the force is not permitted to pay a rate of pay for shared parental leave or anything other than the statutory rate. Yes. And the ba seemingly the basis for making that submission was uh, a construction of the Home Office circular in reference to the police regulations which provide the terms in inverted commas of employment for police officers. Now the answer to that point, if, if it is indeed the point that was being made, I say is schedule 22. So I provided the, the title and <coughs> con contents of the act and actually it's the last two pages that we're interested in. So section 91 simply refers uh, to Schedule 22, which provides paragraph 1, person P does not contravene a provision specified in the first column table so far as relating to the protected characteristic in the second column in respect of that provision. If P does anything, P must do pursuant to a requirement specified in the third column. So if we scan down protected characteristic of sex in the middle column, uh, the exemption or defense as it were of a form of statutory authority only applies in respect to those matters listed in, in the left hand column, uh, none of which includes uh, part five, which is discrimination in employment. So uh, it seemed to me that the, the point being made was that uh, there would be answer to uh, failure to pay uh, a rate higher than the statutory minimum rate because the, the combined effect of the provisions uh, we are taken to is that effectively there's a requirement derived from legislation that nothing more than the statutory minimum rate is paid. But e even if uh, that is right, that is not a defence by virtue of Schedule 22. Say. And just briefly before I embark on taking each round of appeal in turn, I would like to turn to the Home Office Circular, uh, which you will find at page 58 of the Office of the Supplementary Bond. Uh, joint supplementary bond, yes? Got it? Yeah, it should be, I should think it would be in a black hole. Uh, oh, it's an other Supplementary bond is for appeal. Oh, no. what, what's this one? Then? Joint supplementary bond with document. That's in the capital. Okay, right, yeah, yes. Right. <coughs> yes? Which part, which uh, tab? So, uh, page 58. assertion that Mr. Basu made was that this document constitutes a form of authority on the part of the 
Home Secretary yeah. for individual police forces to uh, pay only the statutory minimum rent. But it's nothing of the kind in my submission. It, this document is simply an expression of an intention on the part of the Home Secretary to implement amendments to the police regulations at some unspecified time in the future in the form that's described. But it, it's no more than that. So when we go over the page to 59, the penultimate paragraph, there's simply uh, some advice given to forces encouraging them to apply these provisions on an interim ba basis. So, so I say the, the position is exactly as per the agreed note for the purposes of PPAT. So this is, I'm looking at six, are we looking at six? Is that yes, the so the, the text below that, you'll see, my lord, um, it, it talks about the amendments that will be needed. However, police forces are advised to note the Home Office's intention and are encouraged to apply these provisions on an interim basis. Right. Now, if it's the case that the advice from the Home Secretary was bad advice because the advice given was to implement local policies which are indirectly discriminatory, then they're indirectly, indirectly discriminatory. It, it's not an answer to the claim as seemed to be uh, advanced, albeit perhaps not explicitly. So I, I say, just to clarify the position, it is simply that the police regulations and the Home Office determinations which go with those regulations are completely silent about the provision of shared parental leave and pay for shared parental leave. Statutory, in inverted commas, uh, rate of pay provided for in the local forces policy uh, is not an allowance under Regulation 44 as it is asserted. What, what you haven't been provided with in the in the clip that was handed up it, is a copy of the determination that goes with Regulation 44. That, that that determination sets out what the allowances are. They are. Some, such items as uh, dog handler's allowance, motor vehicle allowance, London allowance. It, it says nothing about shared parental leave pay. It, it is not an allowance as defined. It, it, the, the policy operates in a kind of no man's land, if you will, uh, with reference to the, the police regulations and determinations. But, but it appears that male police officers have been taking Indeed. shared parental leave and Indeed. have been paid. Absolutely. Absolutely, and I say that that is a PCP, or a provision criterion of practice for yeah. the purposes of Section 18, but I, I wasn't quite clear, really, on where Mr. Bassoon was going with this. Well, I think I asked him that, and he said that he, it, it wasn't, because I said, <coughs> although he was saying that there is no discretion and everything has to be in accordance with the... Uh, determination or with this approval as he interprets it that can't prevent the sex equality clause from operating if it operates and it can't prevent this court or a tribunal from um, applying the law to the terms and conditions as they currently stand if they are discrimination I think that was accepted all, all I would say is that if, if it's, there was great emphasis on the regulations and determinations being a complete code as to the terms of employment, the implication, not said explicitly, being that the, the provisions of the, poli the local policy are out with that code, the inference being that they're not in fact a contractual term. And if that's the case, that is the end of the equal pay jurisdiction argument uh, on behalf of and I, 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 well, uh, I may be behind this but I thought this was a kind of a jury point that Mr. Fraser, Mr. Fraser was making. He said, look, if you, if, you were, if you were going to allow this appeal, what are we going to do because there's nothing to provide for increased pay? Well, I thought that was the point that he was making, but I mean, I didn't think it was a, I don't think he was actually submitting that as a result of that, that the analysis should change in some way. What was this raised before the no. PT? No. You can't find any trace of it. If, if, no, if, no, if the police's case was going to be, well, you, you might succeed on every, on every point, but it would be illegal for us to, to pay this. Um, so 
fair to train the fails for that reason. That, speaking for myself, that, that, that's a point which, if it, if it had any steam, it should have been raised before we joined in. Quite so. It's, it, I, I, I only appreciate it with it conceding the point um, as it was being made already today. So I felt the need to address it. But what I'm Let's see where it gets to. You, may, you see the way the bench exert the most on this. Uh, we're not taking this point as determinative of the no. I mean, if Mr. Bender comes grateful. back on it, we'll allow you to say something. I'm grateful. <laughs> Propose to take the grounds of appeal in turn, which means the ground one is, is the equal pay jurisdiction. I, I say this is ground one of the chief constable of the chief constable's appeal. As I understand it, the chief constable has, whether the court agrees or not, I don't know, has, has it conceded my appeal. Yes, yes. So I. In due course, I wouldn't propose to address you on, on that anymore. Yes. Um, That's, I, think, that I think, is made clear. But in terms of the, the equal pay jurisdiction point, I say essentially that Mr. Bruce's submissions have generated more heat than light, and actually the issue is quite narrow and quite straightforward. Um, I'll start by reference to section 66 of the Equality Act. And, and to be clear, it's, there's no dispute as to the effect of uh, Schedule 7, Paragraph 2, that it's essentially the same as Section 13 and Subsection 6. Uh, there is no, there's been no appeal uh, by Mr. Hextall at, uh, at the AT level against the tribunal's conclusion that if this were an equal pay claim, it would fail, and also the conclusion that if this were a direct discrimination claim, it would fail. The, the appeal to the EAT was only on indirect discrimination. To which neither Schedule 7, Paragraph 2, nor Section 13, Subsection 6 applies. One moment, let's take it too fast. So, as I say, the starting point is Section 66. In my submission, this is a, a question of jurisdiction, and the issue for the court is uh, the effect of Section 66. Uh, I say it operates as a, a gateway, and if, if the gate is passed through, the claim is an equality of terms or formally claim, if the gate remains closed, the claim may be a discrimination claim under Chapter 1. And determination of whether the gate is open or closed is by reference to Section 66. Uh, subsection 1 simply means that all contracts have a term implied by statute so that a, a, a sex equality clause is included. And I say that what subsection 2 means is that this a claim will be an equality of terms or equal pay claim if one of the two sets of circumstances at paragraphs A and B applies. So if a term of Mr. Hextall's is less favourable than a corresponding term of the comparator would have to be modified. Similarly, if he did not have a term, which the comparator did have, then his contract would have to be modified so as to include that term. The central issue here is what the term is. And conspicuous by its absence was reference to authority on this point. This would, uh, I'd ask my lady to when you say conspicuous, is the conspicuous is what is the term? What does that what does that mean? That's a solution. Uh, 
it's people from what? Conspicuous by its absence in this morning's submission. Oh, the submission. To authority on the construction of Section 66. It's interesting, it's interesting, the central issue is what is the term, and that wasn't specified in the submissions. Well, there is authority on the process one has to go through in terms of the operation of Section 66. So, uh, stepping back in a nutshell, I say the relevant term is the term as to the rate of pay for shared parental leave. So the corresponding term in the comparator's contract is exactly the same. That is why this is not an equal pay case, in a nutshell. It's never been Mr. Hexler's case that he should be entitled to maternity leave or that he should be entitled to maternity pay. One has to keep in mind that his claim is in fact retrospective. He did in fact take the leave. He took shared parental leave. His claim is about how much money he received he took that leave. But it doesn't matter whether his claim was ever that. The question is whether it could or should have been that. Because I think it, you must you accept what Mr. Bassett said, that it doesn't, it's not the claimant's choice how to formulate the claim. You may, you may formulate it as an indirect, only as an indirect claim. But if in fact it was covered by Section 66, then you must lose. Well, the, that point doesn't take any of us anywhere in my submission because Mr. Hexel would accept that to the extent that the equality uh, clause would operate in a vacuum to give him a right to maternity leave and pay, that claim is prevented by uh, Schedule 7. But that, but that doesn't mean that that is the end of, end of the case in, res in respect of all the other terms in his contract. It, this is why a re reference to authority is so important. As I say, I'm trying to get this. So your your point is that the that the provision that you're concentrating on is the provision to take shared parental leave at a particular wage or salary. And you're sorry, you're saying that's the term you're concentrating on. Yes. And that applies both to um, it, it, both to. Uh, PC Hextool's contract and to PC 836's contract. Exactly right. That, that, that's, that you say it's as simple as that. Those, those are, those and are that his, his point, terms. you're saying that his point in this morning to um, the fact that one party has got, a, in this case PC 836, has got a maternity leave provision, but PC Hextool hasn't, is not to the point because it's not looking at the right term. That's exactly. what you're saying. It's a straw man argument. This, this has been the respondent's approach throughout the history of this litigation to try and tell Mr. Hextall that his case is something that it's not. The, 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 the term has to be identified with precision, as the House of Lords made clear in 1988. Right. And uh, when, when one does that, the term in issue is the term as to the rate of pay for shared parental leave. And that is the same in both contracts. It, it, it's, it's nothing to the point, actually, that we, we heard the debate about whether the rate of police regulation insofar as they make provision for maternity leave and pay apply only to female officers. The argument that, well, it still applies to Mr. Hextall, uh, it's just that he can't exercise the right and so forth. It doesn't actually matter because whether, whether those rights apply only to females or not, we are concerned with rights as to share parental leave pay, which applies to men and women. That is the term that's at issue. And it, I'm fortified in that by reference to the EAT's judgment at paragraph 25, because th this is actually what the EAT decided, not the way it was presented this morning. happy or otherwise, there's a citation from paragraph 25 of the tribunal's judgment on this. What the claimant is asking for is a term of his contract, which is also a term of PC 8360, a term relating to shared parental leave pay, to be upgraded so as to be equivalent to a different and non-corresponding term per contract, the term relating to enhanced maternity pay. Now, 
point I make in my skeleton is that the language of upgrading the term is, is not apt because it's a claim for tortious compensation, not about actually changing the term in this contract. Were you reading from paragraph 25 then? Yes, th there's a quote at the end of paragraph 25. Oh, I see. And Which that is also the, happens to be 25, isn't it? That is the Eton Tribunal's judgment. And the yes. EAC is agreeing with that assessment. And uh, apart from the upgrading point, I say, in a nutshell, that is exactly right. Because the corresponding term has to be identified correctly. So actually, wh whether whether Mr. Hexel had notionally or otherwise a term in his contract as to maternity leave and maternity pay or not doesn't matter in my submission. It doesn't matter because he's not. Well, the question is, I think how Mr. Bassett puts it, is that that is the term, and that is the term which falls within 66.2b, namely it is a term which is absent from Mr. Hextall's contract, and therefore it's absent because he can't take advantage of it, whether it's in theory there or not, and so he has to have some kind of modified version of it. But there's no, that, that, that whole line of argument, rests on there being some kind of requirement on Mr. Hextel to compare his term as to shared parental leave pay with a woman's term as to maternity pay. And that flies in the face of the terms of the section, which require correspondence between the terms, and the case law on that, which oh, requires correspondence between the terms. Mr. Mr. Bursun's submissions, I would say, suggest that we're, we're an exercise in obfuscation on this point. So I wanted to turn to HOSO, tab 19 of the authorities. Just, but you, just before you leave there, can I, can I be clear that you, you said, and I think you're probably right about this, that it can't make a difference to the outcome of the case at this time whether the, the male claimant has a useless clause in his contract um, saying, That, that can't be critical. It'd be very curious if it were, if we were going to divide the nation into, into the, 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 those employees, leave aside the special position of the police for a moment, but those employees where the employer has a standard form contract for everybody for the maternity leave clause, and those employers who have um, uh, a, clause, uh, a contract which for the men leaves out clause 11. So that this, this is something of very wide general application. Yes. Uh, and it also has to be said, of course, in the 21st century, people can change their gender. Uh, there might be scientific advances at some point which would enable somebody who might not have previously been able to bear a child to bear a child. But, you know, that's in the realms of uh, <laughs> science fiction at the moment. We've got enough. We've got enough. My point is say that you say that, but we have a case. You say that we have a case which is coming to a court of appeal where somebody who received their, a, a, tra a trans man who received their certificate mm -hmm. of uh, uh, having transformed gender reassignment mm -hmm. certificate then almost immediately gave birth. Okay. And the big issue there is going to be is uh, whether the um, whether he's entitled to be registered on the birth certificate of his child as a father. So, I mean, actually, you know, it's not all so well, remote. So These things are happening now. Right. So, well, in, in that case, in my, my original, uh, the way the EAT puts it in that case, uh, which is that the, the terms are standard for everybody in respect of all of the terms, uh, holds good in, in, in my submission. But, I mean, the short point at the end of where you're pointing to is that Mr. P.C. Hextel is not asking for a maternity clause. Exactly. He's not asking for that. What he's asking for is that his uh, rate of statutory pay should be higher. He, well, That's what he's asking for. So it's not a case. Of, it's not a case of dissimilarity. His case isn't there's a dissimilarity of provisions at all. Exactly. That's not his case. Yes, and the, 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 the provisions you are say. not dissimilar. They're they're all exactly the same. 
for everybody. The only issue where there might have been a difference, as identified with this question about whether maternity provisions only apply to women or apply notionally to men. But if with that put to one side, there's no question that the maternal standard applies both both genders. <coughs> so for that very simple reason, this cannot conceivably be an equal pay claim. Well, that, this seems to me the most important point in the case, and we we, we brush it aside as though it's an obvious sort of two or three minutes. If you're right, then this must apply pretty much to every employee in the country. That, that, that your case is essentially that it is inherently illegal, un, un, unlawful, indirect discrimination to um, pay birth mothers um, a higher rate of uh, pay when they're off on maternity leave pay a father who is off on preventive leave? Uh, potentially. Yeah. Th there may be, th th because of the peculiarity of the circumstances of this case, whereby the policy, uh, the regulations, of course, don't apply to the police. They, there's only a PCP potentially in this case because of the voluntary policy. There may be an issue, I alluded to it in my supplementary skeleton at the end, in the case of civilian to whether there is a PCP applied if the employer is simply abiding by the regulations. I don't know the answer to that. It's a matter for another day. But it, it may be that it's the peculiarity of the circumstances here where there is unquestionably a PCP because of the voluntary nature of the policy that this indirect discrimination analysis works. I may, it, it may be that it works in, in, in other civilian cases as well. Um, there would need to be full argument circumstances, and there would be questions about justification in other cases as well, uh, in terms of indirect discrimination. Uh, that, that doesn't arise here because justification defense was rejected by the tribunal, and there's been no appeal. But at large, on the indirect discrimination analysis would be the question of objective justification in, in other cases, whether civilian or, or police. How could, it, how could it ever be shown, if you're right in principle? How could objective justification be shown? Well, um, there are a number. Uh, I have um, dealt with this in in the skeleton I produced for the Employment Appeal Tribunal, which um, is at page two one four of the supplementary bundle. So some of the policy uh, matters that were raised by the intervener at that level. There are a few things that I would say. Firstly, of course, by and large, it's in the case of in the case of small employers who don't enhance maternity pay at all, then there's not likely to be an issue because uh, there are slight differences in the amounts, in the way in which statutory maternity pay works versus statutory share parental leave pay. But in both cases, if the employer is simply abiding by I wonder whether, they're, whether they're the indirect discrimination analysis would, would work in those circumstances at all. Small employers may, may very well not have a problem. It's only likely to be a problem in cases where we're talking about large employers who routinely pay well in excess of statutory minimum rates uh, for uh, maternity benefits, for instance. But when, when we think about the objective justification defence, what has to be justified is the PCP. So on the assumption, in the case of a civilian employer, that there is a PCP applied, that's an open question as I've, as I've indicated in my submission, but assuming that there is one, it's the PCP that has to be justified. It isn't the uh, enhanced maternity pay paid to mothers that has to be justified. But isn't that just labor? I mean, it's a clever way of putting it, that in truth, you're objecting to the payment of enhanced rates to women, uh, to birth mothers, by comparison with other parents. Well, the, what I would say is that, the, as uh, explained by Baroness Hale and Homer, the test of justification, we, we all know the, the legitimate aim requirement first, the legitimate 
legitimate aim would probably be compliance with EU regulations. The PCP is statutory minimum rates. The legitimate aim would be compliance with that. And you might very well say, uh, in a lot of cases, well, if the rate paid is in accordance with the provisions of the regulations, then surely that must be proportionate to achieving that aim. Where there would be a difficulty, uh, I would submit, is in the case of large employers who, who pay well above the statutory minimum rates in respect of other types of leave. And the, the, the proportionality test is broken down by Baroness Hale and uh, requires the measure to be appropriate and reasonably necessary. So there would be a question mark over whether sticking to the statutory minimum rate in the case of shared parental leave, when you don't for lots of other types of leave, or at least maternity leave, is that appropriate and reasonably necessary? It may be that the answer is, well, yes it is, because it's the statutory minimum rate and we're simply complying with our obligations. Or it may be that the answer is a fact-specific fact answer depending on the circumstances of the employer. Because we also know that justification can't be purely cost-based. There may be other considerations, such as evidence of the ability to retain certain types of employee if a particular employer has data, for instance, showing that they have difficulty retaining female staff unless they enhance maternity pay, then that, that may be some kind of justification. So um, justification, you look at the facts of each case? Yes. Although they're, they're, I suppose over time, they'll be likely to develop broad categories of very similar cases. But justification is a fact-specific matter. I, I thought that in your skeleton you went further than that and said there's no obligation only to pay the statutory rates. An employer is always free to supplement and pay more than that. Yes. So it can't be said that this is justified as being some with a statutory requirement because there's no requirement only to pay the statutory minimum. Well, I mean, so I don't, I don't, I don't see how you can say that for a small employer who pays the statutory rates both for maternity pay and for shared parental leave pay that they would be able to justify. It, 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 my point was slightly different, my lady. It, was that there, it may be that no indirect discrimination arises in the first place, if, because you, you'd be looking at. They would be paying the same. Yeah, the same measure rate. of damages would be. No, no. The by reference to what mothers or the, the other the other um, category of persons is in receipt of. If they're not in receipt <laughs> of enhanced maternity pay because the employer doesn't pay it to them. Then it may be that there's no no, discrimination the, at all. The statutory rate for 90% of her weekly earnings may well be greater than the statutory rate of parental yes. leave pay, which is the same as the lower yes. maternity leave. So if an employer is paying 90% of the woman's pay when she's on maternity leave, and that is more, perhaps substantially more, than the... 138 pounds or whatever it is per week that you get on shared parental leave, how could that be justified? Well, the, the answer may be in those circumstances, but that probably would be a matter of judicial review of the regulations themselves. Uh, this is my point about whether there's a PCP being applied at all. If, 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 if the small employer is simply complying with the regulations, are they applying a PCP? If not, because, because you might say to, to superimpose this indirect discrimination analysis on that type of case would amount to a kind of backdoor judicial review of the regulations themselves. Would that be permissible? And so would this type of claim work in that context? I, I don't know the answer to that. It's not an issue in this, in this case. But that's a possibility. Can, can I get back to my Lord's original point mm -hmm. where he was emphasising how important this was in general terms? Maybe wrong about this, but my understanding of the point that's being put to you was when you just say that the term is a term related to shared parental leave and the statutory that you pay for that, but actually the substance of your complaint, the point is 
Director is he wants to be paid what he would be paid if it was paternity leave equal to maternity leave. That's really the substance of the complaint. And, well, that, and, that, and that therefore, as you, you switch the focus very, 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 very attractively, at the end of the day, what we're really talking about in, in reality is we're talking about the fact that um, a birth mother does have the ability to take maternity leave for an extended period of time at a higher rate. Well, my, my point is a simple one by reference to Hosso, if I can yeah. turn to that. Tab 19. So, just briefly on the facts, it concerned a discretionary share option scheme. And essentially, what happened is the failure to, fail to bring her sex discrimination claim within the time limit and sought to argue that her claim was an intrude of equal pay claim. Had a longer uh, limitation period that she would not have been more powerful. And I lay heavy emphasis on paragraph 23 of Lord Justice Stanley Burton's uh, judgment. So, it's important to bear in mind this judgment is concerned with the predecessor provisions of the this Act that were actually separate. But I say, Differences with material section one and two of the uh, Equal Pay Act are to the same effect as section 66 of the Equality Act. So this was concerned with the Equal Pay Act. The, the claimant was trying to assert that her claim fell within the Equal Pay jurisdiction. And he says that in order for the claimant to have a claim. Paragraph? 23. must show that it is a claim for contravention of the term of birth contract or employment that was modified or included by virtue of the equality clause. House of Lords and Haywood emphasise the need to identify that term. And he goes on at the bottom of the paragraph, the evidence is clear that there was no difference between the terms of the share option scheme in relation to the claimant and those relating to her comparator, standard written terms. So that there's a, a separate question that doesn't concern us. But aside from that, she's unable to show that there was any term of any relevant contract that was less favourable than the corresponding term, the corresponding term of any of Mr. Pat's race contracts. Or that any contract of his included any relevant term that was absent in any contract of hers. So it, got to identify the term, I might submit. And the term in this case is the rate of pay for shared parental leave. And that is exactly the same for any female officer. So when it comes to section 66, exactly that reason. The term of Mr. Hextor's contract is not less favourable than the corresponding term in the comparator's contract. And it, paragraph B doesn't apply because uh, he, he does have the term which corresponds with the term of the comparator's contract. So section 66 is not engaged in the first place. And that's the end of it. But you say that paragraph B doesn't apply. Because what? Because he, he has well, he, he does have. It's not the case that the comparison. Yes, but then we get back to the point that my Lord Lord Justice B was making, which is that this can't this can't turn on the, the question whether a man has in his contract a maternity pay clause or doesn't have in his contract a maternity pay clause. That would be a nonsense. Yes, he has he has in his contract a maternity pay clause, but he can't he can't um, take advantage of it. So what there is, Mr Basu says, is a failure um, that he does not have a term in his contract 
corresponding to a term of B's contract that benefits B, the term in B's contract that benefits B being the maternity pay clause. And, wait a and so, so you have the sex equality clause operates then to modify Mr. Hextall's contract so that it does have a term which corresponds to maternity leave and maternity pay. Firstly, um, my lady, I understood the earlier discussion to be to the effect that he does have a maternity pay uh, clause in his contract. He simply can't use it. It doesn't change the fact that he does have it. It is there in the contract. Even if that is wrong, that doesn't address the point about the term as to shared parental leave pay because that is the relevant identified term which according to the Court of Appeal and House of Lords you have to identify and the corresponding term on both sides of the equation is exactly the same. This, this is the obfuscation in the, in the reporter's case because it isn't Mr Hextall's case and has never been his case that he should be entitled to maternity leave or pay. That is a term of his contract. There are lots of other terms of his contract which don't form any part of any claim for uh, operation of the sex equality clause. Uh, he is concerned with the term as to share parental leave pay. So you're saying he's not he's not asking for the same amount of leave as maternity leave? That's another very good point, my lady, because this claim is about the rate of pay. It's not about the entitlement to leave. He's never asserted he should have been able to take maternity leave. It's about the amount of pay that he received for the leave that he did in fact take, which was shared parental leave. But it's not part of your case that he should have been allowed to claim or that a, a prospective father can claim rate of pay for shared parental leave at any time from week three post birth to the end of SPL and birth. Yes. And for the earlier part, though not the whole of that, the, the birth mother is most unlikely to be taking SPL because she is very likely to be taking maternity leave. Pre-birth, if anybody's taking any leave, it, uh, it's most likely to be the mother. It was the only the mother. I don't know. Yes. The father, I think. I'd have to refresh my memory cool. about the, the other types of leave, but uh, yes, that, that, is, that would be one system. And the oddity of the way the legislation works is that because it's about pay, it's not actually covered by the equal pay clause because it's not how it now works. Well, it's, the, the point is that it's, it's misleading to characterise the, the dichotomy between equal pay and discrimination by reference simply to whether the matter concerns pay or doesn't concern pay. You have to identify the term. this point, I'd also like to refer to the BMC software and shake case, which is well, have, we, have we done HOSO and European credit management? Okay. Oh yes, that's the... I've, I've sidelined the whole of page 555 of HOSO. Um, I, I would make particular further reference to paragraph 25. The claimant was what the claimant was complaining of was not a difference in contract terms. There it was a difference in exercise of a discretion. But the essential point is it's not a difference in contract terms. There, there isn't a difference in contract, the relevant contract term here. So he's certainly not asking for the uh, a paternal leave and pay equivalent to um, maternity leave and pay because apart from that, as you say, it could be. The, uh, 
the amount of time of leave is not the only part of the same. It's only about the amount, about of, money the amount of money in relation to the, 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 the actual leave that he takes. Exactly. Yes. Is there any previous example of uh, a contractual clause saying that um, you know, you're paid X pounds an hour, X pounds a year for doing a particular job to be held to be indirectly discriminatory because um, it, 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 in practice it, it is less favourable to Uh, yes, uh, the ECJ's judgment in Steinecker. Mm -hmm. well, we not go to it. We not go to it now, but uh, just tell me where, where we find it. Well, so um, <coughs> it's at tab seven of the authorities. Was a particular, particular eligibility requirement, which was that uh, participants had to have worked full time for at least three of the five years prior to starting under the scheme. So the, the rule was the same for everybody. Any eligible person could benefit from this 83% pay enhancement in the relevant period, male or female. But if you were not eligible, then you couldn't get it, obviously. And uh, the ECJ, in a nutshell, says that that was indirectly discriminatory against women because they were less likely to have worked full time in the, in the relevant period and less likely to be eligible. So what the claimant in that case lost out on was the enhanced pay ostensibly available to everyone. operated in an indirectly discriminatory way against women. So stepping back, the relevant terms were the same for everyone, regardless of gender. But those terms operated uh, disadvantageously in a disproportionate way uh, for women. And even at EU level, that was an equal treatment matter, not an equal pay matter. software and shake right at the end of the authorities In view of the time, I'm concerned to get straight to the relevant passages. Yes. Uh, so the discussion and conclusions section of the judgment it's a very helpful explanation. What, which level of court? Excuse me. It's important to court tribunal. I think it was actually overturned on a different point recently by this court. Yes, that's referred to in the index, but I think it's common ground that that judgment doesn't concern us for present purposes. I say there's a very helpful explanation of the operation of section 66 and section 70 and for what it's worth section 71 um, the key 
paragraph in my submission is paragraph 73. Should we, should we read this to ourselves? How many, what would you, is it just 73 you want us to read? Um, in a moment, perhaps 76 as well. So we'll read 73 and 76, shall we? particular reference to the passage uh, a few lines up from the bottom of paragraph 73. Well, I, I've always worked, and maybe I'm this morning, I do find the relationship between 66, 70, and 71 somewhat obscure. But there we are. I'm sure you're not alone. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the particular passage, however, that I lay emphasis on is that Section 70 prevents successful reliance on the employment discrimination provision in Section 39.2 in circumstances where Section 66 applies. So a precondition to Section 70 operating to exclude somebody from the discrimination provisions is that Section 66 applies. And for the reasons I've given, I say Section 66 does not apply in this case, and therefore as a result, Section 70 does not exclude Mr. Hexley from reliance on Section 19. Right, let's just take this step by step. You say Section 66 does not apply because you say it's not a case of imbalance of terms. Uh, and therefore, you're saying um, Section uh, Section 70. What about section? section because, because it has no effect. It prevents successful reliance on, on section 39.2. So there's no reliance on section 39.2. Is that right? It, it, it's simply that uh, what his Honour Judge Hand is saying, and with, with which I agree, is that uh, section 66 has to apply first. If it doesn't, the question about exclusion by section 70 doesn't arise. The key question is, does section 66 apply? That, that's the, the precondition. And you say it does apply, and you, you accept, I think, that section 66 does apply if it operates to incorporate the sex equality clause, even though because of what he mentions, the material factor defence, or one could add, because of Schedule 7, um, actually the terms are not modified. 
to accept that? In, in, in respect of that specific term, then yes, that, that would be how it works. But my point is, that's not the term that we're concerned with. And that when you consider the correct term, there is no inequality. Yeah. Section 66 doesn't apply. Section 70, therefore, does not exclude Mr. Hitzler's claim. That, for the sake of completeness, the Section 71 point, I'm only afraid uh, what Mr. Davis and his leader at the time say in their own skeleton that they don't consider that Section 71 has any bearing on this right, case. So, so the position, therefore, is you're free to, uh, to advance your indirect um, uh, discrimination claim. Yes. Uh, 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 sex, sex discrimination claim. Yes. That's the point. I have, I have also highlighted in my skeleton So just, to give, just give us the reference. Well, uh, unfortunately, there's a different report to the authorities bundle from that which is in my skeleton, and the report in the authorities bundle doesn't have paragraph numbers. So I'll perhaps give you the page references. Right. So so what, what is the bit bundle of authorities? Which, which tab is it? Hayward is in tab four. Tab four. Which page, pages? It's 900G to 903 B. Yes. And in particular, 901 A to D. 901 A to D. says no, you've got to identify the specific term. And you say the only the only corresponding term we're looking at here is the shared parental leave term. That is not more favourable in PC 836's terms than it is in Mr. Uh, Hextall's terms. Yes. And he's not looking for correspondence to maternity leave and pay in the terms that that's set out in PC 836's terms. Yes, and the reality is, if, if the view is that those terms of the women's contract as to maternity leave and pay are in fact at least present in his contract, he, they're of no use to him. He can't, he can't give birth, um, even if there's correspondence in that sense. That's not what we're concerned with. Right, and you say the exercise which Mr. Bassey was inviting us, or saying that we would have to do if it weren't for Schedule 7, Paragraph 2, on modifying the maternity pay and leave towards birth terms so that they apply to him is not an exercise that would be legitimate in any new circumstance. No. It, it couldn't be the same term. The assumption that it's not present in Mr. Hextall's contract, it could never be the same term for, for obvious reasons. Uh, and just before I leave this point, uh, for good measure, in terms of the European provisions which are uh, raised potentially by capital in, the, in their supplementary skeleton, I would refer to the recast is at tab 7 of the legislation. Um, what is this? What, is, what are we going to get out of this? Because, because there, there are arguments made to the effect that uh, if 
something is about pay, then it can't be a discrimination claim. And uh, there is reference made to the case of Anthony uh, McKenna and Gillespie uh, to that effect. But they all predate this directive. So Article 14 of the directive So, what uh, tab are we at? These are cases relied upon in um, <coughs> Chief Constable Scott's. Uh, no, in the supplementary skeleton of capital. The supplementary skeleton of capital. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. My point is simply that whether something is about pay in a general sense or not is not what determines whether the matter is a discrimination matter or an equal pay matter. And that's made abundantly clear by the directive itself, because paragraph 1c of Article 14. My Article 14. This is tab, tab, oh, is it tab 07. 07. This is my thing. says that it covers employment and working conditions, including dismissal, as well as pay, provided for in Article 141. So the directive itself envisages that there will be complaints, which are discrimination complaints, concerning pay, but which fall outside the regime for equal pay So there may be complaints about pay, but which fall outside equal pay provision. Yes. And what is Article 141? The treaty, uh, that means that is now Article 157, <coughs> updated the treaty. The that part of the treaty. relied on uh, frequently in uh, public sector cases uh, directly as the source of the right to equal pay. I, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Beach, I appreciate you trying to abbreviate the points in the interest of time, but I, I, I'm interested. You, you say that in the light of this Article 14, the previous position section, such as Andrew Lowy uh, 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 are now old patterns, have all been overruled. In so the, the, the history of the ECJ judgments and the d division in EU law between equal pay and equal treatment is somewhat checkered. And some judgments have said, uh, in relation to a specific uh, item at issue in a case, this is other equal pay or it's equal treatment. Uh, but the judgments are not not consistent. How, 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 do, how do we get here? Because why are we concerned with this? Because if you're right up to the present point, um, it, it's we're only not concerned. We're not concerned. This doesn't arise. This point. Well, I, I make the point only to to say that in my submission there is nothing inconsistent about domestic law with EU law because the directive itself envisages a scenario where a complaint about, which, which may loosely be, dis be described as a pay matter, can nevertheless be pursued by domestic provisions that are not concerned with equal pay. Well, no one has suggested that we need to read the legislation in any, the domestic legislation in any particular way to give, to give effect to some division or allocation in EU law which is not properly reflected in the domestic law. 
but that's your answer to I, it. I, I, I understood there to be a yeah, I, thought, I thought that I, I, I certainly understood Mr. Farrison to say at one point, I think in relation to section 70, that um, uh, once you, if you fail on your equal pay claim, you can't then make your claim on the same grounds <coughs> for um, right. um, um, sex discrimination. That's, yeah, not, that's not in dispute. That's it's, not it's, it's one or the other. Yes. Yes. That, that was the only point I was sort of making. Yeah, uh, the, these, these, the European points I'm really picking up from the supplementary skeleton yeah. of capita. Um, I think what you're saying is the divide is where the divide falls in accordance with the domestic legislation, and there's nothing in EU law that reads, requires us to tinker with that to make it comply with some other EU provisions. Yes. This ground of appeal, I say, is completely unsustainable. But where are we up to now? Which is um, this is your ground to to you. Yes. <coughs> this reminds me of the usual. Well, the, it's perhaps worth looking at page 35 of the core bond. not right because in James there was a pretty rule applied about interest as soon as you might my own memories you, you heard about this morning and the rule itself was a proxy for gender so both the disadvantaged group and the advantaged group were percent male and 100 percent female. In the words of Baroness Hale in Essen, more recently in the Supreme Court, there's exact correspondence between the function of the rule and, and the proportion in which people are affected. So in this case, what we have is a PCP of the rate of pay of shared parental Pool is anyone who is interested in that uh, rate of pay. And what is asserted on behalf of the pool is that it's only males who are adversely affected by that PCP, and it's only females who are not affected by that, who are not disadvantaged. That's self-evidently not the case, because the very reason why the direct discrimination claim failed was because, the, as the tribunal identified, some women will be in the same position as the men. Female, birth, female partners of birth mothers can't take maternity leave. They have to take shared parental leave. So any disadvantage experienced by the male group is also experienced by those females. So there is not exact correspondence in any view. This, um, this ground of appeal it cannot possibly succeed, succeed on our submission. <coughs> I would add that in terms of the male group... So this ground is divided into two parts, right? 2.1, 2.2. Two point one. 
they fail to apply for it, the mutual exclusivity will the same act can be both direct and indirect. Well, nobody is suggesting that it can. Right, so you're saying that's not going to the right point. Well, two points. It's, there's not in dispute that the same matter cannot be direct and indirect discrimination. At so the, same the point time. is, one, it's agreed. Uh, two, James Neasley is different. Is that the point? Yes, absolutely. Right, because in this case, there are people of both sexes who would be affected. Uh, well, in terms of the, the disadvantaged, the, the male group affected, disadvantaged by the PCP is obviously 100% male, but in comparison with the female group that is not, uh, because of the fe female group uh, to whom the PCP applies, some of those females will be, will also, will be disadvantaged and some of them will not, will not be. Yes, I so think it's, it's not 100% on both sides. That's right, I hope that's what I just said. No, I yeah. think you've got the, the wrong way round. In the, the group who are advantaged are all female because they're um, the ones who can get maternity leave, but there are only females who can get maternity leave, whereas in the group who are stuck with shared parental leave, some of those are female. Yes, exactly. there, are two, there are two different ways of Framing the comparison, disadvantaged and advantaged. Strictly speaking, under the terms of Section 19, you're required to compare on protected characteristic lines, so male group versus female group. So the male group is 100% disadvantaged if you don't include the opportunity for adoption uh, and that, that route to a harvest pay. If you exclude that, male group is 100% disadvantaged, but the female group is less than 100%. Sorry, I, I was trying to get just a very simple point, which seems to be quite complicated. The text in 2.1 is agreed. Well, the reference to James Eastley is irrelevant because it's not the same case, because in that case, uh, the two categories by which there was a comparison was being made was both exclusively male and exclusively female, as I understand it. Yes. Whereas in this particular case, one group is exclusively female, but the other group is both female and male. Exactly. That's all. I mean, that's, that's quite it. simple. Yes, but in terms of the agreement, however, I don't agree that the EAT failed to apply mutual exclusivity. No, 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 I no, I agree, but I'm saying what's agreed is, yes, you agree that the same act cannot be both direct and discrimination. Yes. Right, well, that's straightforward. Then we've got 2.2. Now, what, what are we looking at there? So that, that is to do, are we now, now 2.2, are we now dealing with what I think is critical from the point of view of um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the appellant here, the sex tool, uh, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, the, the chief constable, um, which is the, the definition of the pool, who's in the pool? Is that what 2.2 is looking at? Because you, you, in order to show that there's a particular disadvantage, you've got to identify who's in the pool. Well, I think the, the, I understood the contention to be that the pool as defined by the tribunal was a finding of fact, and that on that basis, the EAT had no business overturning it unless it was reversed. Because it, that's what I understood by re reference to the uh, EAT erred in overturning So all I'm saying is, at, at some somewhere in these grounds of appeal, it's a very simple point. Somewhere in these grounds of appeal, we need to address the issue which is critical from the point of uh, uh, the chief constable, which is who is in the pool. Yes. Well, and I, it looks to me at the moment as though that's two point two. Oh, so it's just, it's just, where does it fall within this? Is it two point two or somewhere else? I see. Yeah, but, maybe, um, I've, maybe I've got that wrong. I, if I just make the submission anyway. Yes. Um, the place to start in relation to this question is the Supreme Court's judgment in Essex. In my submission, uh, that's at tab 30. Thank you. 
particular paragraphs 40 to 41. And the speech barriers here. There she's addressing the facts of the Naim case in one of the two, two under consideration. Terms, I say paragraphs 40 to 41 of this uh, speech constitute the answer to this point. You want us to read this? Yes. yes. It's that last sentence in 41, so we'll be relying on identifying the PCP and also identifying the full for complete for, for comparison. Yes, and, well, and, and in particular, there is no warrant for including only some of the persons yes. affected by the PCP. You've got to include everybody. So, uh, in other cases, the word affected, the words affected by and interested in are, are used interchangeably. critical point is that the force seeks to exclude, as I understand it, women who have given birth because they've given birth. And the question is, fundamentally, are those women, do those women have an interest in the PCP? I say, yes they do, because they are free at any point to choose to switch to shared parental leave. They were free before having their baby to choose to take shared parental leave instead of maternity leave. Granted, not many such women are likely to make that choice in circumstances where they get full pay on maternity leave and very little pay on shared parental leave. But that's, that's not the point. They have the choice. And for that reason, they are affected by the PCP. And that's why they must be in the pool. why the direct discrimination claim fails is because the material circumstances are both the man and the woman taking shared parental leave. But the operation of Section 23 is fundamentally different in this context. I would lay emphasis on the words in the section to the effect that the PCP puts or would put Concerned with the situation where it's actually happened. It's a much higher level of comparison, taking into account people who are not necessarily taking any type of leave at all. They're going about their day. So, can we just have a look at section 23 and 1? On a comparison of cases for the purposes of 13, 14, and 19, which is where we are 19, there must be no material difference between the circumstances relating to each case. Exactly. And so. But do, do you take, do you accept that that means 
that there must be no material difference between, amongst the people in the pool other than their protected characteristic. All the people in the pool must, must be in the same circumstances, except that some of them are men and some of them are women. The same material circumstances. Same material circumstances. And what, what, what is material? Well, do you, to start answering my question, do you, do you accept that that's the case? Well, that that's how that section, section 23 says. And the question is how, how that operates. It, it can't be right for the comparison under a section 19 claim to be exactly the same as a comparison under a section 13 claim, because otherwise there's no point to having a section 19 at all. You only, be, only ever be assessing direct discrimination claims. And I, I'm not alone in that. Lord Justice Underhill uh, makes this a very similar point in the Court of Appeal in like this same Naeem case. So that, that's the previous uh, tab, happily. Is there, is there any guidance in the jurisprudence on the meaning of the word material? Yes. Where is that? I, it, perhaps if, if I could refer you to these passages, and I'll take you, the, the next case will be the Supreme Court's judgment in Cole. No, I don't agree, my lord. Because if the pool is doing the PCP exists at all times, is implied is applied at all times to all officers. So regardless of which choices a mother might take, for instance, that option of shared parental leave is always available to her. And the rate of pay is always available to her. So the, a, a prospective birth mother has to think about and make a choice about which type of leave she's going to take. She has an interest in both. The, the source of the disadvantage, the context factor, as it's described in, by the Supreme Court, is the fact that she has this other option, which the men don't have, and also the, birth, the female partners of birth mothers don't have. So the pool is all officers that have an interest in taking leave to care for a child. That, so that's everybody? Basically, it? yes. You exclude people who have no interest in ever having children, uh, or who, who, for whatever reason, are not able to, for instance. And they may have, have adoption options anyway. It's a very wide pool, because the PCP applies to everyone who is a police officer. But the wit whether the pool contains a million men and a million women or 20 men or 20 women doesn't really matter because what you're looking at is which, what proportion of them can are disadvantaged by the PCP. Yes. And that, that may be the same proportion of disadvantage whether there are 20 of them or a million. Yes. Yes, that's right. if I deal with what I was going to deal with and uh, the, I have several arguments to make about why it is that birth mothers should not be excluded there, there from is that. Something, there is something odd about this analysis I think it's one can think of it, 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 it centres around the fact that, 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 the, the, that women who are interested in having children in your, in, your, in your case, fall within the pool. They're not in any sense disadvantaged as regards, uh, they're not in any sense advantaged 
as regards anybody else in the pool, insofar as they wanted to share parental leave. That, that, that's the peculiarity of this analysis, is that this isn't a case where, within the pool itself, if you want to do, if you want to do X, you can do. Some people can do X, and they're disadvantaged over others in the same pool. This is a case where, in so far as they all want to do, look after children and take parental leave, they're all in exactly the same position. That's what's peculiar about this analysis. I, I don't agree, my lord. They're not in exactly the same position because a man, a man, the, the disadvantage is not the rate of pay he receives in comparison to to a woman in her 30s. Disadvantage is in comparison with what he himself would normally receive in terms of full pay at work. So when he's sitting around trying to think about what he's going to do, am I going to take some leave, am I going to stay at work, he has a difficult choice because all of the consequences that flow from receiving much less money in terms of household budgeting and so forth, he has to deal with. And it makes the choice about taking the leave difficult. And for, for a mother who has the option of also doing that, having the same choice, but also has another option of maternity leave at full pay, her decision about whether to have a child and take that time off or not is very much easier because for the relevant period in this case, she'll be paid at full pay. Obviously, she's not, going, she's not likely to choose you know, to take shared parental leave instead precisely because, for that reason doesn't change the fact that she has the choice, whereas the men don't have that choice. They, they either have to stay at work or accept the financial consequences of taking the leave, whereas women don't have, have to make that choice. That's the fundamental disadvantage in this case. No, I understand, I understand. But you would have thought, when you're defining your pool, and you're saying within that pool, are there some people who suffer a particular disadvantage? You might have thought what you're looking at is the factor that defines the pool. And the factor that defines the pool is the fact that they want the old world to leave and they all have that statutory pay. That, that's the peculiar. I'm not saying you're necessarily wrong, but there, you know, there's something in the analysis that feels very uncomfortable. It's, I, I, think, I think the answer to your point, my lord, is that. Um, there's a difference between being affected by or interested in the PCP and wanting to take shared parental leave. Your, I, I, your analysis, uh, your, 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 the analysis that you posit, my lord, uh, suggests that there is no interest in or, or, or being affected by the PCP unless one actually takes the shared parental leave or is only interested in taking that type of leave. But I, I, I say that's not right. Well, sort of, but, but you define the PCP is defined by the people who are interested in taking shared parental leave. That yes. is defined. It, it, the, 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 the whole the answer to the case would be entirely circular if you exclude the very people who are not interested in taking shared parental leave precisely because they have a much more favourable option available to them. The, the fact that they have the choice means that they remain interested in or affected by the PCP. So what you say is that the disadvantage is taking a cut in pay and everybody who takes shared parental leave takes the same cut in pay but there are women in the pool who take either don't take a cut in pay or take um, less of a cut in pay because they get 90% of their monthly statutory pay. But the availability to them of something which offsets the disadvantage that they get by the application of the PCP if they take shared parental leave is, is sort of an extraneous matter, isn't it? There, there are lots of reasons why a man might be very rich, he might be able to get some income in some other work at home, say. Um, 
and so he wouldn't be so disadvantaged by the cutting pay that he takes when he's getting shared parental leave because he has other means to make up the difference. So, so might a woman? Yes. And you, you, you couldn't impose those circumstances on the male side of the comparison and not impose them on the female side. But, but why does the fact that the woman has one more of those, namely the possibility of taking maternity pay, turn that into a different kind of extraneous matter from a whole host of extraneous matters which might make it worth the person's while to accept that. It, it, it is the, the context factor, as the Supreme Court calls it. I think it's very important to look at paragraph 26 of Baroness Hill's speech. In name. Well, it's oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Paragraph 26. work through this conundrum. Mm. If, 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 if you were talking about, if, if the pool is defined by all those who want to take time off to look after their child, I could see you on, I could see the point much more clearly that you're making. That's a much clearer position there because it, the women then have that against them. They can do it through that or they can do it through share. There's the main community and other. It's not, it's not defined in terms of those who want to, who want to, the PECD is not defined in, in terms of, of, of those who want to look after their child, it's defined by reference to the statutory limit on uh, shared parental leave, but can you get, can you get to that position by, by looking as it were, through that, at what it's all aimed at, is looking after the child? Well, the, can you get there through that? The reason why the PCP is what it is, is because is the term in the shared parental leave policy which applies to all officers and in terms of the pool no, I understand, I understand what you're saying but that's the, the well, I suppose there are two ways of looking at, at the, the people who are interested in though in terms of the pool as defined by my judge Richardson anybody contemplating taking leave to care for their child, by definition, has an interest in the PCP of the rate of pay for shared parental leave, because they, that is one of the options available to them. They have, they, if they're fortunate enough to have a choice, they have to make a choice between taking that rate of pay or doing something else. And at the nub of this case is the fact that that's the only choice available to men, whereas women in in the same pool, who still nevertheless are interested in the rate of PC, the rate of pay for shared parental leave, have another option. No, I know, I know, no, I think you've got that point very, very firmly in your mind, and we understand that. I think the point I'm trying to make, and I need to be, be quite careful, is I, I can I can see more clearly the force of your analysis. I'm not saying it isn't any more benefit, but it more clearly if you're if, when one's looking at the, this PCP, which I assume is the correct PCP for this purpose, it is really, it is really um, what you're saying is the reason it's a relevant PCP and discriminatory is because what underlies it is the desire of employees to take time off to look after their child. That is both an element in maternity leave, and it's an element also, as it happens, in, <coughs> obviously, in shared, in shared uh, parental leave. Then it's obvious, if you, if you, as it were, looked at that rationale, then it's much more obvious that within the, within the, within the uh, pool, you're including everybody who would want to look after their child, and who might want to take it, and in the case of the, 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 the men, non-birth mother partners, the second uh, um, one could quite easily, much more easily see that they are at suffer a particular disadvantage in wanting to do that. And I'm just, I'm not quite, I'm not sure it's right or wrong at the moment, as it were to, when applying the PCP for the purpose of identifying the pool, 
to further elaborate by reference to what underlies it, which in the case of parental leave, shared parental leave, is looking after the child. Am I making any sense of that? Obviously not. I, well, <laughs> I, I, I think so, except that if I've understood correctly, the effect of doing that would be to limit the scope of the pool, ostensibly, to those people only interested in taking shared parental leave. No, it, 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 it extends to anybody. Well, you're, you, you know that's how it looks. At the moment, it's limited in that way. If you're defining it as it is at the moment, paying only the statutory to pay for those taking a period of shared parental leave, um, then you're looking at all those people who said who might want to take a period of shared parental leave. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm saying it's slightly different than what you're really looking at. That may be the PCP, but what you're looking at is the prejudice to people who share all one characteristic, which is they want to look after their child. Anyway, let's not take up more time now. Well, I mean, I, I can't, I, I don't think I can do any better than no. Alice Hill in the Supreme Court when she says yes. that. Um, this is 26. Well, can I suggest, I, I'm, I'm, that I've been dying to say this, and I've been holding my breath. It's important to understand the points, my lady and my lord, to read the whole of Baroness Hill. I, say, I agree. For what's been said, the answers here, but you need to look at from 23 onwards, which goes through all the salient features of indirect, and that may help the conundrum that you're dealing with here to become yeah. apparent. Yeah. You go through the whole of that because, and also you could look at how she then applies those salient features to Aesop and Naim, which may help as well. Okay, okay. So we'll look, at, we'll look at 23 onwards. Now, before we finish tonight, it's going to be fast. Do you want us to do 26? Yes, Your suggestions and read from 23 onwards overnight. Um, now, how are we doing in terms of time? We can't go on beyond tomorrow. If, if we really have to, we'll sit at 10. We have a lot to do outside court. But if, you're, if, if the view of counsel is that we really need to start at 10 in order to make sure we get through the case, we will do that. If it's not really necessary, we won't. Why don't you think about it, have a word with your colleagues, and, and let us know. And um, we'll either make it ten, start at 10 or 10.30 or 10.15. Very well. Thank you very much.